Welcome, welcome everyone. <laughs> oh, you're in for a big, big treat today. You're going to be very excited with this movie I'm showing today and you're gonna have all those warm feelings swirling around in your heart by the end of the movie. And that's appropriate since we are have a topic of uh, true intimacy and holy relationship, why would you not end up with big swirls in your heart, lots of heart energy moving through you with a topic like this. So I'm excited today because um, I haven't shown this movie for quite a while, but it's, it's like an old friend. It's always right at the surface of my mind ready to be bursting out and and I have such a great heart opening emotion every time I watch this movie. And it's I think it's one of our all time classics. So this is perfect for holy relationship and true intimacy. That's what everyone wants. They just want to feel love, lots of it, lots of connection, overflowing love spilling over all over the place. Love, love, love. That's all we want. <laughs> like the Beatles said, all you need is love. So we're going to zoom into it. And actually, as you know, this is part of the Holy Relationship Weekend, but we have a, a large group of people joining us from around the world just for a movie day today, but they're going to get to feel and experience everyone as the day goes on. And we have the breakout rooms and then Peter comes back to do a Q and A on this movie and, and all these great themes. So as you know, we, we put out a poll, movie poll of themes and then you vote on those themes. And then I pray for a movie from Jesus that will really help really help us have a deep experience of those themes. The Your most important themes is really what we're aiming for. And this week, I think I mentioned it already on, on Friday when I was on with Francis, but uh, yeah, the themes for this week, the top uh, theme came in with 112 votes, way more than anything else. So it was being 100% dependent on God, Holy Spirit. And we know that that's like the key. Of course, that's the key, being God dependent. That just means we want to be guided, that we want to be directed. We want inner instructions. We want our intuition to lead us the way we live. We want to live from the inside out, not from the outside in. <laughs> Even though in the end, Jesus shows us that the inside is the outside <laughs> and the outside is the inside. At the beginning, we don't get that, you know, he's like, Whoa, whoa, that's a little too much, Jesus. <laughs> Let's start with my inner world and that world out there, you know. So Jesus is going to help us today to get more in touch with our intuition, the inner voice, the, the stillness within, and most importantly, take 100% responsibility for our state of mind. What does that mean? It just means we're finished with the blame game. We're finished blaming. We're not going to do it anymore. We absolutely refuse to do it because we feel guilty when we blame. We feel guilty when we project. We feel guilty when we look outside of our mind for false causes and we try to pin our upset onto the false causes, whether it's diseases or it's the weather or it's politicians or it's our partner or it's our family, whatever it is. It could be a mouse loose in the house. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever we believe is external to us that's upsetting us is, is our misperception. And we want this misperception corrected for once and for all. We don't want to be messing around with this projection blame game anymore. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's not satisfying. We want to be happy. We want to be loving. We want to be joyful. We don't want to be blaming uh, and, and then feeling guilty after we've blamed. So we're one out of that game. The second theme is forgiving all thoughts of responsibility, duty, and obligation. And I, I know that, that one came in second with 67 votes, but 
I know that for most people I've talked to in my life over the last 36 years with the course, uh, that's, that's one of their biggest issues is they feel like a sense of obligation and, and duty and responsibility. And they, they feel they are lacking in that area. They haven't done enough. They're not enough. Um, they could have done more. Uh, they all, there's a sense of, oh my gosh, I wish, I wish I could get out on, under this burden with my, particularly with family members or partners. Uh, what I did, what did I do wrong? Um, maybe I missed my chance. Maybe I didn't do enough. This is a huge thing. Uh, and I've been talking to a lot of people all around the world for, for decades about this. And what A Course in Miracles is saying is we actually have one responsibility, and that's to accept the correction in our mind, the atonement, it's called. Jesus says that's the sole responsibility for the teacher of God, the sole responsibility for the miracle worker, except the atonement for yourself. It's actually less than 139 from the workbook. I will accept the atonement for myself. And this world is, is the projection of responsibility. So instead of like Jesus saying, oh, I'm 100% responsible for my state of mind, and I choose to be happy. I choose to be one with God. <laughs> I choose to be one with my creator, which is what Jesus did. That was true responsibility. But the world is the projection of responsibility as if it involves people, places, things, partners, families, jobs, careers, citizens. Maybe you feel you haven't been the best citizen. <laughs> You could have been in your country. You could have been a better citizen. It doesn't matter. The world is the projection of responsibility to an external world that was made up by the ego to keep you guilty. So that's why you feel you haven't been good enough. I haven't been a good enough mother or a good enough father. I haven't been a good enough brother or sister, not a good enough partner. I've not been a, a good enough neighbor. I'm not, I'm not a good enough Course in Miracles student. I'm not a good enough Course in Miracles teacher. <laughs> it, it goes on and on and on. It's the projection of the mind's responsibility to accept the correction from the Holy Spirit onto the world in a make-believe, fictitious world that God didn't create. And actually, God doesn't even know about. But the Holy Spirit sees the world in a new way of pure innocence. He knows that everyone's innocent because spirit is real and bodies are not. So we can't think that we're going to be happy if we keep trying to project our guilt onto the bodies and we use the world as like a dumping dumping ground. We can't, we can't use the world as like a trash container to try to project all the trash from our mind onto the world. It's like Jesus is saying, give it a break. The world's not your problem. It's, it's in your mind. <laughs> That's where the problem is. It's not the politicians. It's not the nuclear weapons. It's not the pandemic. It's not the, the neighbor that scowled at you or the, the person that gave you a frown or, a, or told you some kind of criticism. No, it's in the mind. It's always in the mind. So our third Basically, third theme here we have is true charity, seeing God in all my brothers. So basically, true charity is, is very much like, I'll call it like true empathy. When you come inside and you get in touch with what's real and true within you, then you can extend that truth to everything and everyone, right? It's it's your mind. If you have the light in it, why not be a bringer of light? You know, instead of trying to play small and, and hide, why not be a bringer of light wherever you go? Why not be a bringer of happiness and joy? Let people feel the peace in your heart when you interact with them. And part of being able to do this consistently, of course, is undoing the ego and undoing the self-concept. Jesus says, 
Whenever you feel the need to become defensive about anything, you have identified yourself with an illusion. You see? So if you are identified with the body, of course you're going to feel helpless at times. You'll feel weak at times. You'll feel uh, like you're not good enough if you're identified with the body. But the more you start to come back into your mind and you start to realize, oh, I have a powerful mind. My, my mind is actually part of God's mind, and that mind is very beautiful. It's just filled with light. It's not doesn't have any darkness in it in its holy state. But when I'm asleep and dreaming, then I have these strange, strange things floating through my mind, and they're called attack thoughts. And that's why that's why we call it a split mind. You might say that the sleeping mind is schizophrenic. It's it's believing in the split, it's believing in the separation, it's hearing multiple voices. We call them humans, but actually it's multiple voices. <laughs> they don't agree. <laughs> they never agree with each other. <laughs> All these multiple voices, the committee in our mind, like in the, in the movie Violet. And finally, remembering to go towards those given me by the spirit. That's something that uh, Francis and I talked a little bit about on Friday. And you could see and hear that last night. Wasn't that a great uh, session with uh, Jiska and Nicholas and, and Linda? Wasn't that fantastic? Weren't they so transparent? They were so transparent about following their heart, facing their resistances, facing their challenges. And I would say, uh, you know, they gave a pretty good insight into not only do, do they have to really be transparent in their daily life, in a living in a house with six people total, if you're going to be consistently open hearted, then you really have to be very transparent and very willing to expose private thoughts and not to please other people if you're going to maintain your happiness in a house where you have six people and a cat. <laughs> we saw Iso got in, got in on the game yesterday too. He, he's very, he loves, the, he loves the spotlight. So he actually took Linda's chair at one point. <laughs> he was going to be, he was trying to replace her on the panel. But um, what we find is that, that this transparency and I think um, Linda talked about it a little bit with her friends and family, and um, and um, Nicholas talked about it with different relationships he had, and Jessica talked about it with her mother, with her children, with her her partner, um, with her sister, and I think again when we talk about practicing A Course in Miracles and going all the way with the course, which is that's why I think you're here with me today, is you want to go all the way with it. You know, you're not going for 75% with this healing. You want to go 100% and take 100% responsibility for your state of mind. But for most people, the stickiest area and the most challenging area is relationships we'll call them uh, interpersonal relationships with family and spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, that, that rings the bell as the most difficult. People have told me for the last 36 years, David, those are the most intense relationships by far. I'm indifferent with most people in the world, but I get stuck in my practice with A Course in Miracles with partners and families and, and uh, close friends. Now, it must be that there's some kind of trick going on if we feel that much intense emotion when we even think of these people, you know, even when we're thinking of them, whether they're physically present or not, there's a lot of intensity there. And I would say that I needed to give you a little bit of metaphysics uh, to remind you of the metaphysics of the Course, because those metaphysics are extremely important if you're going to give your whole heart to practicing forgiveness. Now, the reason that these intense emotions arise from time to time is because they've been hidden. They've been suppressed. 
So we're dealing with a lot of emotional suppression and repression here. That's why they're not in your mind constantly. <laughs> you know. And where are these intense dark emotions coming from? They're coming from the unconscious mind. Now, unconscious means you're not aware of it. So, so if there's a darkness in your sleeping mind that you're not aware of, it is the unconscious mind. And Jesus says it's very dark. It's so dark that uh, he calls it the dream that you dream in secret. It's like you're playing a game on yourself and you're putting all your dark thoughts in the basement of your mind, like the basement of your house. You're stuffing it all down there in the basement. And you're trying to be happy on the surface, but you've got a lot of darkness. There's a lot of cobwebs and dust and darkness in that basement. And you have got to go into the basement if you're going to work with Jesus and, and escape from this dream entirely. I remember I, had, I adopted a cat years ago. It was a little three-legged kitten, and I called her Tripod. And in the same house where, that I was living in uh, since 25 years ago, um, we have a basement here. And this house was built in 1847. This house was built before the Civil War in the United States. It's an old house, not in terms of Europe, but I mean, some of you in Europe are going, ah, that's not old at all. That's that's, that's young, that's kids games. But um, we're not talking Middle East or Mesopotamia, we're talking United States, 1847, and my little three-legged cat always wanted to go in the basement. So I finally, I said, go ahead, I opened the door, I let her go, and like two hours later she came out, she looked like Darth Vader. There were cobwebs that were so old in this basement <laughs> that she was wearing a, her Darth Vader uh, Halloween costume when she came out. I mean, black, black cobwebs. She was covered in black cobwebs. She looked like Darth Vader. And, uh, and people don't like to even think that they have an unconscious mind. They just like to think that something in the world is, is tripping them. So they'll say, oh, I'm having a bad day. This happened to me, David, this and this and this. I'm like, yeah, it's just the unconscious mind peeking up into the surface of consciousness. It's not about the weather. It's not about what somebody said to you, what somebody did, you know, no, no, no. All the surface grievances are projections. They have nothing to do with the upset. But lesson number five, I'm never upset for the reason I think, yeah. It's the unconscious mind is where the upset is. So in relationships, we start to feel safe enough. Sometimes in certain relationships, we start to feel safe enough. And then we get close, we feel more connection, more love. We feel closer than ever, safer than ever. And then lo and behold, up comes the ego from the unconscious mind, like a volcano. It just erupts. Uh, out of nowhere, seemingly, but it's it's coming from the unconscious, and it's it's very shocking for all of us. None of us like it. It's traumatic. It's traumatic, is what I'll say. But what is how, what is the context for all of this? And I'll say that when the mind believed in separation from God, which of course is just a belief, because you can't actually separate from your Creator. That's impossibility. But but with the belief in separation from God, it was such a horrific feeling, it was, Jesus calls it the unholy instant, the time of terror, he calls it, it was so horrific that it was pushed out of awareness. But when the mind pushed the unconscious out of awareness, it also pushed the light out of awareness, because deeper than the unconscious mind is the light of heaven. So, so we're talking a case of double jeopardy here. <laughs> You know, pushing the darkness into the unconscious also pushed the light further in the, which is underneath the unconscious. So now what we consider the human race and what we consider our interpersonal relationships, those are way off on the surface of the mind. And they are just projections of what's going on in the mind. How do we get past this? Well, well, I called it double jeopardy because it's pushing the, the light and the darkness out of awareness. 
I will also call it double oblivion because the light is who we are. That's how God created us as the Christ, his perfect spirit. But the darkness that's over, overlaying that, that's covering over our light, is, is making the light oblivious to us. And we're oblivious about this intense darkness. We couldn't even function during the day if we were fully aware of this unconscious. It would be so horrific and so frightening that it would just be Freddy Krueger 24-7. <laughs> just, it would be the nightmare of time and space. <laughs> and the reason we have the, we experience nightmares from time to time is because these unconscious dark thoughts uh, come up from time to time and we have nightmares, we have cold sweats, we have night terrors. But we're dealing with double oblivion. So the projected world, when people say, I don't like society and I don't like the world of, I don't like all the laws and rules of this world and I don't like how I have to do certain things all the time, I don't like having to conform, those are all projections too. There's only one law and that's the law of love. That's, the, that's what we were created as, is love. So really, let's keep it honest here. We're dealing really with one law from God, which is the law of love. That's what we were created in. And now all these other laws are make-believe laws of time and space that the ego has made up, laws of medicine, laws of economics, laws of disease, laws of, uh, of hierarchies and striving, ranking. Um, it's, it's a world of competition. It's a world of... Um, scarcity and lack. It's, it's a world of changes. It's a world of extremes. It's a world God did not create because there's only the law of love, but that's the light and it's pushed out of awareness and it's covered over by this unconscious darkness. So today's movie is going to give us a good opportunity to follow along with the characters and I'll give you lots of good uh, a commentary to, so you can stay on the magic carpet ride with me and again this is one of those movies that's not maybe as visually intense as uh the matrix visually as intense as uh the island but with the matrix there was a projected computer generated world in the island there was a make-believe world of memory it's, it's using memory in a distorted way, both in the island and the matrix, so that there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lie, there's a secret that's underneath the projected world. And you know what the lie is? It's the ego. The ego made this projected world. That's the secret. That's the lie that's underneath it. Now, I know in this world, a lot of times people will call to me, write to me, and they're, ask, they're always asking me about conspiracies, you know, all these conspiracies, but really there, there aren't multiple conspiracies, it's just the belief in the ego is a conspiracy against your true identity. That's a conspiracy. <laughs> if you want to know about a conspiracy, believing in the ego is a misplacement of identity. It's attempting to, to substitute fear for divine love. Talk about a, a conspiracy. That's a, that's a major attempt to put fear in the place of love. It's, it's enormous. It's not, it's not a minor thing. It's an enormous attempt at, at substituting fear for love. Now, the way that the ego deals with trying to protect itself from the Holy Spirit and from the Jesus and the light is this projected world. It, it's hiding in the unconscious mind and it's using a projected world which seems to be happening to you as a person uh, that's being generated from from the unconscious mind so it's very much like the matrix it's a it's a it's like a generated false world that's just projected from the mind now projection we've already talked about denial and repression let me talk a little bit about projection because that's that's, I think those are the two major defenses against the light, denial and re 
Denial and projection. I've already covered denial <laughs> in great detail. Projection is the attempt to get rid of something you don't want by seeing it somewhere else. So it's like looking into a kaleidoscope and saying, oh, I don't want to feel bad, but oh, look at that. Oh, I don't like that. Look at the red in there. Ooh, purple, green, yellow. You know, it's seeing the, the anger, the envy, the jealousy in the world of form as if people are, are angry, as if people are envious and jealous. You see, it's a big trick to trying to see in the world what you don't want to face in your mind. It's quite an ingenious trick. And yet this world is the result of projection. So you, I can say also projection doesn't work. When you try to see something that you don't want in your mind as if it's in the world, then you're keeping it in your mind. That's a way to keep it. You're not forgiving it and releasing it. You're seeing it as if it's outside of you. And there's, there is nothing outside. I can tell you right now, that's the ultimate realization of spiritual awakening is that there's nothing outside of you. You're it. You're the whole. You're the whole. <laughs> and there's nothing outside of the whole. But projection is an attempt to blame, to see it as external. So I thought I would uh, read to you just a little bit about projection from Jesus in A Course in Miracles, just so you're saturated with this idea before the movie of, of how the world we seem to see isn't what it seems to be. It's a trick of trying to see outside what is inside. Just like last night when Jessica was talking about, you know, her mother and, and she was saying, you know, I'm going to ask you one question and you, you cannot answer no or we're done. And, and are you going to be at my funeral? But, but that was a a projection of a fearful thought, and then it's answered by joining, by really connecting with somebody and, and, and realizing we're the same one. I'm not going to blame you for something that I have believed in. I'm going to release what I believed in so we can remember our wholeness, remember that we're, we're connected, we're the same one, we're not different at all. So here's what Jesus has to say. This is from chapter 6. What you project, you disown, and therefore do not believe is yours. You are excluding yourself by the very judgment that you are different from the one on whom you project. Since you have also judged against what you project, you continue to attack it because you continue to keep it separated. By doing this unconsciously, you try to keep the fact that you attacked yourself out of awareness and thus imagine that you have made yourself safe. Wow, I'm going to read that last sentence again because this is describing why the unconscious mind was made. In other words, it was made to try to feel safe. Oh, a horrific feeling? Oh, let's just forget that. Let's push it out of awareness. I don't even want to deal with, the, with this feeling of separation from God. Push it out of awareness. By doing this unconsciously, you try to keep the fact that you attacked yourself out of awareness and thus imagine that you have made yourself safe. So the, the unconscious mind has been pushed out of awareness and the light has been pushed out of awareness in a defensive maneuver for the sleeping mind to try to be safe. You know, if I, I sometimes want people say, can you can you say that in another way? It's like they say in Italy, ah, forget about it, forget about it. <laughs> forget about that separation. I'm not interested in that separation. Well, separation from God is no small belief. <laughs> you know, if you talk about a crazy belief, that's the most insane belief. And it's forget about it, push it out of awareness, and then when you project the world, it seems like the world's attacking you. It seems like people are attacking you. It seems like the weather is attacking you sometimes, a rainstorm or a tsunami. But that's all just a projection of the belief that you could attack yourself. 
What does that even mean? Well, if you believe you're separate from God, that, that has got to be the big attack thought. Underneath all the grievances and judgments, there's one, one that is underneath, it's unconscious, but it's the belief that, that you have attacked yourself and attacked God. That is not in awareness. Jesus does, he hints at that for the first time in lesson number 13 of the workbook, where he says a meaningless world engenders fear. That's what lesson number 13 is. And then if you read down, once you go down some paragraphs toward the bottom of the, the lesson, he brings in his first cause and effect, true cause and effect uh, idea of the workbook, where he's saying, a meaningless world engenders fear because I think I am in competition with God. <laughs> Woo! He drops the atomic bomb already in lesson number 13. You see, he's bringing together a meaningless world engenders fear. He's bringing up the emotion of fear and he's saying, because I believe I am in competition with God. What does that mean? I believe I have an ego and God didn't create the ego. I believe I'm in a world of time and space and God didn't create time and space. I believe I'm separate from God and I'm not. <laughs> I'm really one with God. You see, that's a big, that's a horrific, so you see, it's hidden, it's pushed out of awareness. Now, he says a little bit further, he goes on the next paragraph, yet projection will always hurt you. It reinforces your belief in your own split mind, and its only purpose is to keep you, to, to keep the separation going. It is solely a device of the ego to make you feel different from your brothers and separated from them. The ego justifies this on the grounds that it makes you seem better than they are, thus obscuring your equality with them still further. Projection and attack are inevitably related because projection is always a means of justifying attack. Anger without projection is impossible. The ego uses projection only to destroy your perception of both yourself and your brothers. The process begins by excluding something that exists in you, but which you do not want, and leads directly to excluding you from your brothers. So the world is a trick as if there's something external that you don't like. But the reason it seems external is because the mind projected it that way. So it's tricking itself. First you believe in the ego, which is to believe you can attack yourself. And then you project a world that the ego projects. And basically it seems as if the, the attack is external. And how could you ever feel safe if the world is constantly seeming to attack you? You know, uh, oh, somebody stole my money. Oh, what happened? Somebody broke into my house. Uh, somebody, I was out today, first somebody started yelling at me and then they hit me. They hit me. You see, that's pretty strong evidence of, of attack. And certainly bodies can seem to attack other bodies. We're not saying that that isn't a perception. We're saying that that's a projection of the ego, the whole world. Now today's movie is going to help because this movie, like a lot of other movies in our Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, is, is, a, is a, a generated world in which something horrific has, help, has happened in the past. We don't know exactly fully what it is, but we know something bad happened. Like in The Matrix, you know, we finally found out that Morpheus tells us that the, the machines turned against the humans and then the humans retaliated against the machines and you got a war between the machines and the humans. In this movie, something happened that was very traumatic. We know it comes from the unconscious mind. And then the world was, the society was reformulated to, to guard against those traumatic feelings, to guard against those traumatic emotions. Sound familiar? 
Am I talking about the movie society or Earth? It's the same. <laughs> that's why that's why the movie's so helpful. So the world with the society was made to bring a sense of order where there is chaos. Unconscious mind is chaos. That's why we have judges. That's why we have traffic lights. We have rules, societal rules, societal, we have laws that are part of countries. We have things that people are telling me now they're very upset with. Some people are saying, David, in our country now we're having vaccine mandates. They're, like it's the worst thing in, they've ever encountered in the history of the human race is a law mandating a vaccine. And I'm like, well, it's just another ego projection of, of fear. Uh, it's, it's in the mind. It's not, it's not the governments aren't doing this. The, the, their people aren't doing this. This is a projection of fear. So in this, in this movie, there's there's a, a, a society and they try to bring about a sense of harmony through organization and structure and rules, okay? So this society has a lot of organization, structure and rules. They don't, you're not gonna see a lot of sexual activity in this uh, society because there's proximity warnings. They're not even, this society's got so much control, they're not even gonna let the bodies come together to touch. It's not, you've gotta, you've gotta be, have a, you've gotta be very careful just to come and touch, much less sexual activity. Um, they're very controlling in this society about words. You know, they, they have very specific definitions of certain words and they don't want to trigger any kind of deep emotions. So they keep, of a very limited communication, which is that the words are very defined. This is the opposite of Socrates. This is the opposite of Plato, who were into open discussion. You know, everybody can ask anything. You can ask, bring up anything. Like my gatherings, bring up anything. No topic is off limit, bring it up. There's no taboo topics. You know, I'll talk to anybody about anything at all. I don't care. But in this society, in the movie, there's a control over the words. So it's called precision of language. Imagine you're having a discussion with somebody and you use a word and somebody goes, ah, precision of language. You've used the word. You've, you've used a word that we don't use. <laughs> uh, I think that's there's part of, of that in our society where we where we say don't use uh, certain words because they're offensive. But nowadays with the internet, I don't know. People seem to be using every word, <laughs> every word that there is. Nobody <laughs> seems to care about what what words they use. But not in this society. In the movie, there's some structure around language and communication. So. The other thing is, uh, is uh, they seem to have procedures of dealing with um, children, babies, and they seem to have procedures that are dealing with the elderly. Um, so this, the whole reason that this society in this movie was built was because there was some deep emotions that were so destructive and so chaotic that a world of control was made up, a society, a community, a community of control was made up to minimize the threat of these deeper emotions. So basically, this is a constructed community and world that was designed to give a structure, an organized harmony. This is about organized harmony. <laughs> Only problem is harmony, harmony from God, harmony from Jesus can't be organized. It's just, it's what is. It's, it's actually just a fact. <laughs> harmony is a fact. It doesn't need rules to maintain it. It just is. It is what it is. When you know it as it is, you know, it, oh my gosh, everything's harmonious. It was created to be harmonious. So 
basically what we find is that there are emotions that have been pushed out of awareness. And, and I would say at the beginning of this movie, did anybody ever see uh, the movie Pleasantville? Did you ever see Pleasantville? You know, where it's all kind of black and white and then the colors start coming through when the passions start to, to come back. This one's this movie's like that. It's going to start out black and white because the deeper passionate emotions have been projected, or I would say repressed and covered over by, they use injections in this movie. I think this movie was made a lot of years ago. I don't know, quite a few years ago, but but it's, uh, they use injections, <laughs> vaccines. They use vaccines to keep emotions suppressed. And, and basically, uh, the only thing I'll say about that is there's, there's a part in the course workbook, uh, workbook lesson 135, where Jesus is telling us about this connection and this harmony. And he, he's basically saying we can experience this consistently, this harmony, except for three things. These are the three things that Jesus tells us not to do. And don't you love it when Jesus gives you three things not to do? Because he usually knows, he, he definitely knows what he's talking about. <laughs> this is the way shower telling us. This isn't, this isn't like a theory. And Jesus says, you can really stay in the connection, stay in the unity, if you don't do any of these three things. He said, don't, don't activate the past, don't organize the present, and don't plan the future. Isn't that beautiful? The way shower just gives us three things. It's real simple, three things. All you have to do is don't activate the past, organize the present, or plan the future. Now, in this movie, these people definitely are trying to avoid the past in a big way, but they still believe in it. They're still activating the past with all their rules. They've got a lot of rules. And they are doing it by organizing the present. They are taking the society, the family structure, the communication, and they're coming up with roles so that the, the society can function in a harmonious way. Does that sound a little bit like our world? You know, father, mother, sister, brother, and all the, the occupations, the roles, that's what uh, Jessica was talking about last night, right? And 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 Nicholas a bit, and then certainly Linda was talking about it. She was talking about it with her family, friends, her father. It's the roles that are the ego's attempt to organize the present. When you become completely present, when you come into the I, I am presence of, of who you really are, guess what's gone? The roles. <laughs> I always laugh, even with religions, I always laugh because some religions I've, I've seen when I've traveled around the world, they, they don't want to offend men or women. So when they talk about God, they talk about father, mother, God. But they're just projecting duality onto God, you see? Because <laughs> father is a role, and mother is a role, and sister, brother, they're all roles. And, and all the roles of this world are projected by the ego, and they're all used to organize the present. They're used to organize society. How, how could you have a society without roles? <laughs> you know? And what if none of them are true? What if maybe Jesus is saying, hey, if you want a role, here, I'll give you one, miracle worker. Try that one on. <laughs> Teacher of God, try that one on. You see, he's, He's going to throw something in that's a little more expansive than the other roles. Also in this movie, the main character is going to be so helpful for all of us because he's going to come upon a ritual where the main chief elder of the community is going to hand out the roles, the current roles and she's going to pass out everybody's roles, and he's going to get a very rare and unusual role. And, um, and I think that's beautiful because he's, he's going to be called uh, the, 
a receiver, the first receiver of memories. He's going to be given the role of receiving the memories of the whole community, what's underneath this whole community, this whole society. And he's going to be given an apprentice um, played by Jeff Bridges, who also was the first receiver. He also had that role. And we, we are told there's another, a, a woman played by Taylor Swift, the, the singer songwriter, Rosemary, and she had been the, the first receiver too. So this is almost like the, the society psychic, the, inside, the society in, intuitive, who is starting to receive some of the memories and the, and the intense emotions that the whole society has been designed not to experience. <laughs> And we all know, we know people in this world that seem to feel a lot. And, and they have a broader expanse of, um, we might say, perception, because they have more of a full range of emotions. They're not so repressed. They're not so much into denial. They're more, they're more open because they have more of a broader picture of all the emotions. And then the chief elder of the community is played by Meryl Streep. Uh, some of you were with me uh, recently and several weeks ago when I showed the movie Don't Look Up, which is very popular now. Uh, and um, Meryl Streep was played the president of the United States in, in that movie. But in this movie, she's playing the chief elder. And uh, She's definitely got some secrets. It's, it's really not a good thing when, when the chief of your tribe or the president of your country uh, is not in line with truth or spirit. It's, it's really a projection of chaos and havoc. And she does her best to try to keep control over the, the society. But in the end, this is just showing that in the end, we have to take full responsibility for our state of mind. We can't, we can't look to politicians. We can't look to political leaders. We can't look to the United Nations. We can't look to the world as a source of our peace of mind. Our peace of mind has to come from our intuition within. And this is what the inward journey to healing is about, it's starting to go fully to your intuition to be guided and instructed and letting go of the belief in external rules and regulations. Jesus is not telling us to uh, just completely ignore the ego's rules. He was a good example when he came to earth 2000 years ago and uh, the Jews had a rule like, you can't go into the temple to pray unless you pay the temple tax before you go into the temple. So when Jesus and the apostles, when they went to go into the temple, they paid the temple tax. They paid the tax. You see, that's important. Because Jesus told us, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and unto God that which is God's. Jesus is taking us back inside toward the one law, the law of love. But he's not telling us to overtly try to rebel against and overthrow the laws of the land. He's teaching us how to transcend the whole world through love. He's teaching us that if we identify with who we really are, we are under no laws but God's. That's lesson number 50 of the workbook. I am sustained by the love of God. He's teaching us that when we follow our intuition, we follow the Holy Spirit, everything will be taken care of. Without rebelling against the ego, without rebelling against the world, but using inner guidance to transcend this world, and to come to expand your perception from a limited ego perception to the Holy Spirit's holistic perception of the world. 
That's what spiritual awakening is all about. It's about allowing the Holy Spirit to expand your perception. Sometimes people will say, the Course teaches that the body, the body only has one function for the Holy Spirit, and that is communication. The sole function of the body is for communication for the Holy Spirit, not for competition, not for comparison, not for striving and achieving, not for gaining material possessions. No, nope, that's not what the body's for. It's only for communication. And then there's one part in the Course of Miracles where Jesus says that the body can be used to expand your perception. Ah, oh, isn't that lovely? Now we're really starting to see, oh, that's what the body's for, to expand my perception. What does he mean, expand my perception? He's, he's wanting us to see the big picture. He's wanting us to look at the world like the Holy Spirit sees the world in a holistic way, where there's no separation. The Holy Spirit sees the body as completely neutral. The Holy Spirit sees all events and encounters and situations as completely neutral. Why? Because the Holy Spirit does not judge anything of this world positively or negatively, because the Holy Spirit knows it's not real. Why would you judge something positive or negative if it doesn't even exist? <laughs> and the Holy Spirit knows that this world is false, completely false. So the problem of judgment is the ego trying to read meaning onto the, the movie. Like we watch a movie on television, for example, and only time you get upset with the movie is the meaning that you've read onto the, the scenes. It's not the movie that's upsetting. It's the split mind that keeps projecting meaning, false meaning onto the world. That's what's upsetting. So, also, this movie is about open communication and transparency. And our main character, his name is Jonas, and Jonas has two friends, and his friends are a, a girl named Fiona and, and a boy named Escher. So this is really a movie of three friends who seem to be dealing with there must be more to life than what we're perceiving. And if you, if you talk to children, or especially if you talk to any teenager, if you would interview a teenager and you would say, what is frustrating to you about Earth and about planet Earth and its, uh, its difficulties, they would say, there, I hope there's more. There's got to be more <laughs> than this. They would tell you. And these are three, um, three teenagers coming of age who, uh, you know, Jonas and Escher and Fiona, they're coming of age, they're good friends, and they're dealing with their family issues and their societal issues and what their calling is in life. They're trying to find out uh, what their calling is. So Meryl Streep, the uh, the the chief kind of a, of the tribe, um, she's going to give them roles to help them fulfill their roles. But our main character, he, I think the more that he goes into his given role, which is a receiver of memories, he starts to have his heart activated. And I think that's what happens when we study the Course. When we really study the Course, all of a sudden our heart starts to get activated. I mean passionate. We start to get really activated, like, oh, there's more than this personality self. There's more than this society. There's more than this limited country or, or culture that I seem to be dealing with. There's much, much, much more in awareness than what the mind perceives when it believes in the ego. The ego is like blinders. So when you believe in the ego, you're just perceiving a small, a small fragment of perception that's 
seems to be a private little world and it's a, a private perspective on the world that has nothing to do with reality whatsoever. It's, it's like you're in your own perceptual jail, you're in your own perceptual prison. And when you offer your opinion, you're saying, here's my tiny little opinion. <laughs> and, and the angels are all laughing. They're like, oh, <laughs> oh my God, another opinion. Oh my God. The angels, they're just like, oh my God, so many opinions. No truth, but so many opinions. And yet, we're going to watch Jonas go on a journey where he starts to get activated, and his tutor is uh, the receiver of memories who will reveal himself as the giver. That's what we want. We want in this world to encounter a giver. If you ever encounter a true giver, you stay locked in on that giver. <laughs> you, that's your gateway back to remembering heaven. Because a giver is, God only gives. God is the ultimate giver. God is the giver of love. God is the giver of light. God is the giver of, of wisdom. God is the giver of strength. And the man in this one, the giver, is played by Jeff Bridges, and um, he is going to have an apprentice, uh, which is going to be our main character, Jonas. And also we find out he had another apprentice named Rosemary, uh, but it was extremely intense for Rosemary to receive these memories. It would be intense for any of us to start to take on all the memories of history. <laughs> That would be that would be kind of overwhelming <laughs> if you had to take on all the memories of history. And yet it's for the purpose of spiritual awakening. The Holy Spirit is is going to be very selective and pick miracles for us so that we can come to a holistic perception of the world. That's how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit always helps us to see the world in a in an expansive way. It's expanded perception. It's not little tunnel vision, it's expanded perception. So that's how the Holy Spirit expands our perception, is through communication. That's why our community lives by the, the guidelines, no people pleasing and no private thoughts, because those two guidelines were given to me from Jesus to help us learn to trust, to expand our faith, to learn to be transparent, to learn to be open, and eventually to be open-minded, which is a state of non-judgment. If your mind completely opens like a flower, then you don't judge anything. When your mind is open, it doesn't judge anything. It, it doesn't even know what it means to judge. But when your mind is closed and asleep, then that's all, it's, it's addicted to judging. It's like a little ticker tape going in your mind all the time, just judging every little thing that it perceives. Just judge, 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 ticker, 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 like a little stock ticker tape going on in there. So that's what the Holy Spirit's job is, is to lift us through guidance to a state of mind that's so pristine that there's no judgment whatsoever, not a, not a speck of judgment. That's why Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. He was saying, if you don't judge, you'll know that you're the Christ. <laughs> but if you judge, you'll sleep, and you'll forget that you're the Christ, and you'll experience much ado about nothing, is what Shakespeare called it. <laughs> if you judge, you have to take on the much ado about nothing world. So, that's my little introduction for the day. I now introduce the movie, The Giver, on this Holy Relationship Weekend. What do I have to say about The Giver? Ooh, absolutamente spectacular. It is, it is exquisite. This is, you are in for a fine experience today, because this movie will boom, 
boom to your heart. Your heart will explode open, <laughs> especially at the end. <laughs> That's what it's designed to do. So let's enjoy the movie together, and I will come in from time to time to give you some happy uh, ideas along the way. And remember, this, this community in this movie, this society or community, this is representing the world that we have perceived. Uh, it's gonna show us some insights about a different version of the world that we have perceived. Where this world is what some people would call more of an attempt at utopia, where there's rules and guidelines to make people behave. <laughs> <laughs> we know how that goes. Uh, we can see in our world, eh, not so good. <laughs> and in this world too, yeah, it's it's only, you know, it's it's a trick. So it can't last very long. So enjoy the movie and have a wonderful time. And I will see you very shortly. <laughs> You're getting the the gist of this. This this is a society that's designed to be harmonious, designed as a community to eliminate fear, to eliminate pain, to eliminate um, comparisons and, uh, and conflict. Everybody just has a first name instead of a last name. Uh, there, there are curfews at night. So nobody is out partying and drinking too much and waking up with a hangover in this society because there's a curfew and nobody is, is going out at night. They have to obey the curfew. Now we saw that they have nurturers, they have these communities, these centers where the nurturing center where the babies come in. But we saw that, uh, that some of the babies that weigh more are, are given, uh, they're allowed to come to the ceremony, they're allowed to participate in the society. And then those babies that weigh less, you can see they're, they're sorting out the babies based on, on how healthy they judge them to be. The genetic ones the weigh more. Uh, in this society, it's better to be a fat baby, because <laughs> you get in. <laughs> and then if you're not, if you're, if you're weak or you're a frail baby or you uh, uh, you're, you're thin, you're a thin baby, you get sent to elsewhere. That's a very convenient word for eliminated. <laughs> and all those elderly ones there at the ceremony for all their great service and everything, um, uh, when you get to be elderly in this community, you are sent to elsewhere. Isn't that an interesting word, elsewhere? And I think this is important for us to realize because again, even in this world, there, there is a, a fear of death because people say, well, nobody knows what happens when you die, but it is elsewhere. <laughs> That's what most people agree on, is elsewhere. And they say, what about, what, where do you come from when you're born? Well, definitely it's elsewhere. <laughs> you know, there's, there's nothing visible in this world that shows where you come from before you're born or where you go when you die. So even though this society has all these rules to perpetuate calmness, harmony, you can see that these are, are still rules that are trying to mask over the fear. And I'm talking about psychological masking here. I'm not talking about the kind that you wear to, to uh, over your face. I'm talking about the psychological masking of the unconscious mind. That's how it relates to us. This is just an extreme version. This society is an attempt to find a utopia or to manage the, the emotional gift difficulties of the human race by using rules to protect against these emotions. But I would say this is still a, 
a form of um, repression because uh, there are just emotions that they will not allow them to even speak of. Uh, they ask, they ask um, Jonas, they said, how are you feeling about the graduation ceremony? And he says, honestly, it's, it's terrifying. And his mother said, Jonas, precision of language. Oh, I'm anxious. You see, you're not allowed to use terrifying. <laughs> you're just able to say, I'm anxious. So that's an attempt to manage even the emotions, the feelings, manage the feelings. So I would say this is definitely not a no private thoughts, no private feelings, uh, no private, uh, no people pleasing um, community. This, this community is more of a masked community <laughs> with lots of rules to try to manage fear by keeping it out of awareness. Now, a lot of you, when you were listening to uh, to Nicholas and Linda and Jiska, you know, maybe you were thinking, oh, that's, it's a little scary, uh, talking about intimacy and living in community. I see Amanda smiling, yeah, co-living. She's like, oh, hell, you're bringing back co-living to me now. I'm just co-living with Micah now. I said, much more manageable, <laughs> much more manageable <laughs> than a house with 18 people. <laughs> <laughs> but actually what I'm saying is the people are just reflections of your mind. So it may seem scary to you the idea of being in a community or living with people, but actually the point of spiritual awakening is to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, let the darkness come up and, and let it go to release it. You see how that's different from suppressing it? It's actually to let the emotions come. And when, when they come up, don't, don't shut them down, don't repress them. And, and certainly I'm not encouraging you to project them either and, and look around at your brothers and sisters and blame them for the emotions that arise in, in consciousness and awareness. So you can see that under the guidance of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you will be entering a curriculum of healing release of intense emotions, of attack thoughts and grievances and opinions, and you will be opening up to collaborative means of letting the Holy Spirit come through you in a guided way that will teach you progressively to see your brothers and sisters as they truly are, which is, which is you. They're you. <laughs> they're, they're literally you. <laughs> they're, not, they're not different in any way. It's like you're always meeting yourself, even though the ego has convinced the mind that these are other people, other countries, other cultures, other languages. It's not true. It's, it's a big trick. This is the trick of projection. Uh, this is the trick of differences. But in this society we're watching in the movie, they've tried to legislate sameness. <laughs> so the, the, the ruling government is like, now be, be the same <laughs> and, and be, be courteous, be polite, but also let's just eliminate and push out of awareness any kind of intense emotions and let's use injections every morning to make sure that those intense emotions don't come up. So this is not a society where there's the violence. This is not a society where there's road rage. Usually they're on their bikes. <laughs> they, they, are, they don't have highways <laughs> with road rage. They're just on their bikes. Um, also, this is not a society with a lot of sexual interactions. Uh, this is, they've kind of been sanitized of sexual sexuality. And so you may say they're not quite as passionate. I don't know about the, the Espanol, the Spanish people are going, ah, no, no, nada, 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 out. We don't want this kind of society. <laughs> we want some passion. But we can see that, that basically they're trying to guard against uh, intense 
emotions because all we heard at the beginning was in the beginning there were the ruins. That's not a very good word for your history. <laughs> ruins. <laughs> What's in your history book? Oh, the ruins. The ruins. <laughs> That's not. So now we see that they're trying to guard against the ruins happening again. And this is this is a trick of the ego too. That some of the ego the, says, "Oh, the past was dark, and you got to protect against it." So this movie is helping us see a version of some of the things we see in our families, and some of the things we see in our cultures, in our governments, but in a maybe a more controlled, milder version, so we can see it. My point is, it's still a projection. <laughs> you can't legislate peace of mind. <laughs> Even if you've got good good laws, you're not going to come up with with societal laws that will bring you to peace of mind. Because why? Because the kingdom of heaven is within. <laughs> it's it's not in the projected world. <laughs> it's not in the projected world. You cannot legislate your way to justice. You can't legislate your way to peace of mind. You you have to forgive in your heart. You have to forgive everything you believed and thought was true. Like the Buddha taught, empty your mind. Like, like uh, Ramana Maharshi taught, empty your mind. Like Jesus Christ taught us, empty your mind. Come with holy empty hands unto your God, he says in workbook lesson 189. So we're seeing in this movie, this is the society that's helping us to see the projections of the mind. Even the controlled projections are still projections. They're not what they seem to be. They're still projections. So can you see the parallel with our world? <laughs> you know, the world, the society needs workers, right? Construction workers, farmers, nurses, doctors. You see, it's not that different. And, and we could say that the governments of the world uh, and, the, and the universities of the world and the companies of the world, in their hearts, they're saying, thank you for your childhood. Now we're going to, <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Thank you for your childhood. Now you're going to spend the rest of your life working to support the gross national product of the, of the country. Uh, you're, you're the ones who are going to build the future society. This is what our education system is based on, you know, developing skills and abilities for what purpose? Productivity, expand the gross national product for countries. Well, what are the countries going to do with all this money? Armies, military, <laughs> roads, <laughs> buildings, skyscrapers, you know. And then they have uh, organizations to protect, you know, governments, lots of governments, and on and on and on. And so you can see in your mind, when you just buy into the role of this world to be something in the world, even a mother and a father is part of a role to help raise children to be productive members of what? Of society, you see? It's a big game. This is the matrix. And as soon as you go through all this education, you get raised by mom and dad, you go through preschool, kindergarten, you go through grade school, you go through high school, then they send you for more education, you go to university, and hopefully you graduate. Some of us don't. Some of us go, Jesus gets us. Look at Nicholas, Jesus disappears of the universe. Jesus intercepted Nicholas in high school before he could get into the ego system of bigger, better, faster, more productivity, gross national product, Jesus intercepted Nicholas, like young Jonas, Jonas at, at the high school level. <laughs> and this is what Jesus means by, I'm calling you out of the world. 
he's saying you have a purpose to wake up and remember the kingdom of heaven. You were our, your sole purpose is to forgive the world and to remember where you truly came from, which is spirit, God. The whole purpose of the world is only to remember God. It has no other purpose whatsoever. I told you on Friday that Nicholas's father called me and he said, he, he wants to dedicate his whole life to this. And I said, hey, yeah, it's very worthy cause. <laughs> <laughs> Very worthy cause. <laughs> I know people please, even parents. I know people please parents. Yeah, that's right. You, it is a very worthy cause. I don't know if he was expecting that, but that's what I told him. You know, because I know that the projection projected world is a trick to keep you small, to keep you limited in your identity to keep you from knowing who you are. That's what the projection's about. It's a very systematic projection designed for one purpose, to keep you from knowing who you are, who created you. If you know who you are, you also know who created you perfect, which is, which is God. And that's the I am presence I'm talking about. So at this ceremony, the chief elder, she's just passing out all the roles of that help maintain the society, that help maintain this game. And, um, and then she says, thank you for your childhood, you know. Now, I, I did like Asher's response. He said, you can keep it. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for your childhood. Yeah, you can keep it. I think, I think I've said the same thing, you know, this is when you really start to transcend this world, you know, Thank you for all these things in form. You can keep it. I want to know God. I, I, I want to know my creator. I, I want to know pure love and infinite love. I'm not interested in the gifts and trinkets of this world. I'm, I'm talking, I want to know my true identity, you know. And Jesus is the best teacher for that because he was the first one to wake up to remember that. Uh, that true identity. There are many great teachers, and there are, I've talked about a lot of them here, and I've, I've talked about them for many, many years and decades, but Jesus is just a symbol of a mind awake. So I know in terms of my own, you know, people used to always say, David, who was your teacher? Who was your teacher? And I, I say, well, Jesus was in my heart, in my mind, and then his, his voice got very direct and loud in my mind, thank God. And that made everything really simple because I didn't have to worry about conflicting voices anymore. You know, oh yeah, let's see what the boss says. He doesn't really like that word boss because he's he's the same as us. So he, he says, there are no bosses, you know, but I'm, I'm like the elder brother who I've done it. I've been through the obstacle course already so I can help you. <laughs> make it past the obstacle course, you know, that's, that's what Jesus is. He's just very friendly and lighthearted and very joking all the time, very humorous. But so now we see that little, that Jonas's sister, little sister Lily noticed and told the father, his father, uh, they skipped over Jonas. So now for some reason, uh, Jonas is the last one to get his uh, assignment. And you can tell he's a little bit nervous because he was already nervous going in. And now he doesn't know what, what's going to be asked of him, what his uh, assigned role will be. Now you all have your assignments there. You're to receive guidance for the present using memories of the past. That's it. That's, that's your function. You're to receive guidance for the present using memories from the past. Why? Because the mind is so addicted to the past and so addicted to the future that, that the Holy Spirit has to use the symbols that the ego made. And everything that you can think of in the past was made by the ego. And everything you can think of in the future <laughs> was made by the ego too. 
you can just call me David Akashic Records. <laughs> and I'm telling you that that all these memories have only one purpose now is to be used for present guidance. So you don't have to aim for the future anymore. You don't have to worry about how my life is going to work out because that's not your function to figure the future out. And you don't have to figure out history either. Isn't that good news? You don't have to figure it out. But you do just have to be open to guidance for the present using the past, the past symbols. And that's what guidance always is. Whenever you receive guidance, it's just the Holy Spirit reaching you in a way that you can understand, in a way that's meaningful to you, that will loosen your mind from the ego, that will loosen your mind from the self-concept. If you keep following the guidance, you will be led into mysticism. You will be led into revelatory experiences of direct experiences of the light. And Jesus tells us this in the Course. He says, under my guidance, the, your steps, your steps you take will, will lead you to revelation, under my guidance. So the more you follow the guidance, you're preparing your mind for the light. That's, that's the point of guidance, to prepare your mind to remember the light of God, the light of heaven. And you have no other function. This is it. It's really very, very direct. It's just your function, again, is to remember God. I see Antonio over there in, in Portugal. Fatima. That's right. That's what Fatima was all about. Who showed up there in Fatima? Mother Mary. Oh, very good. Antonio, he's been to Fatima. And when she showed up, who did she present herself to? Was it to the priest, to the politicians, the soldiers? No, to three children. Mother Mary showed up <laughs> in Fatima. Uh, in Portugal and appeared to three little children. And it was an amazing miracle story because it, it, it showed that if you really want to remember your true function of remembering God, even Mother Mary can show up. <laughs> Over 19 centuries later from the Jesus story, she shows up in Portugal and she instructs the children. And then she instructs the people to pray. Why, why should they pray? To remember God, to, to know God's will. Oh, so if this can happen in Portugal, <laughs> this you all have to remember that that's your purpose, is only to remember God. And all the guidance you get is just going to be for the present, using the past, the symbols of the past. That's what guidance is. Just what our receiver, uh, first receiver, who will he will call himself the giver, but he's giving the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. It's just to use the symbols of the past for the purpose of remembering the present. It's really that simple. It's there's nothing more. Guidance is not about manifesting to manifest a better world in the future. That's a that's a misuse of the word guidance. <laughs> Guidance is not manifesting. Guidance is using the symbols from the past to, to discover the holy instant, to discover the revelatory light of truth. And that's the only purpose guidance has. If, you, if you're saying to yourself, well, I'm supposed to be following guidance, but the Holy Spirit and Jesus have been, they've not been doing a very good job. I, some people tell me I started studying A Course in Miracles and my life got worse. My life is worse now from studying the Course in Miracles. And I'm saying, well, maybe if you're using it for manifesting, you might have that experience. They said, yeah, I expected my soulmate and a big raise at work and a yacht. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mother Mary's just going, oh, yikes, humans. <laughs> God, these humans say they're into the new age manifesting now. Oh my God. The angels are like, Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. You could know the light of heaven and you want a yacht. Ah. So anyway, here we go. Here's the instructions. Now the, 
the first receiver is drawing our new first receiver closer. And now we're going to start to see that the giver is going to bring a more holistic view of, of memories that have been repressed and suppressed from awareness. This is like opening the valve and saying, hey, hey, Mr. Black and White, <laughs> let's, let's let a little bit of color come in here too. You know, I know your, your elders do not like you to see too much living color, but let's just open the valve and pull in a little living color here because there's a lot of memories and you're not gonna be able to forgive them until you can first welcome them. You have to welcome them from the unconscious mind before you can let them go. You see, that's how it, it works. You can't suppress them and expect them to be gone. You have to let them up and then give them to the Holy Spirit. So you have to feel the feelings, in other words. You have to feel, feel the feelings before you release them. And that's any really good psycho, psychotherapist or, or psychologist will tell you the same thing. You cannot deny the emotions and expect them to be gone. You have to allow them and then release them. <laughs> so there you see, there's a proximity warning Social distancing. We did not invent the word. <laughs> this is social distancing. You get a warning from a, a little drone if you touch somebody outside. Citizens are reminded not to touch uh, people outside of your family units. So we can see that, that the world of control is controlling the temperature so there's no snow. It's controlling so there's no colors. It's eliminating racial differences. It's eliminating ethnic differences. It's eliminating, obviously, language differences. There's just one language <laughs> that they, they all speak. And, and even with that, it has limits on, on uh, use of words. You know, prox uh, what is it? Efficiency, proficiency of language. And we can see that, that the attempt here is to control the form to bring about a sense of sameness, which will eliminate conflict and differences. Now, what Jesus is telling us is, yeah, sameness is good because sameness is spirit. We, we actually are all the same. Behind all of these personality cells, we actually are the same one. We're, at, we're the identically same one, the Christ. But differences seem to be so apparent in this world. So the society is attempting to use rules and legislation and, and basically they've eliminated even mountains. <laughs> they've eliminated mountains. But there's this cloudy place called elsewhere and nobody's allowed to go there. So they basically have have the boundaries. You stay you stay on your little flat piece of land here, and you have a dress code, you have a curfew, you have proximity warnings, and uh, you get your injections every day. They're, they're free, free injections every morning. Got to take your emotional injection. You have to basically. It's all meant to maintain a sense of contrived order or organized order. And this is the problem of the world. You know, we all know that, that we've seen that in families where the families try to enact order. <laughs> rules are called rules. <laughs> Maintain the order in the family. And then we have, that's why we have police forces. That's why we have military. That's why we have prisons. That's why we have judges. Uh, that put people at times into prisons. It's it's a it's a systematic attempt to maintain some amount of order in chaos. And believe me, since the world was invented by the ego, this world is chaos because the one that made it is chaotic. God is not chaotic. God is the creator of spirit. God creates perfect spirit and love in heaven. There's no chaos involved in truth. 
There's no chaos involved in spirit, in, in light. But in this world, this is a projection of chaos. And then judgment was invented to try to bring some order into chaos. Jesus tells us this in the Course. That's how judgment began, was the attempt from the ego to minimize the chaos, so that you could, you could, uh, that the lie of your identity and this world would be somewhat palatable, somewhat digestible, somewhat acceptable. So just the ego just sprinkled in judgments to try to bring order into chaos. The only thing is, you can't know who you are when you judge. That's the, that's the downer. You judge, you don't know who you are, <laughs> and you, and if you don't judge, you know who you are. <laughs> that's the only, that's what it costs you. When you give up judgment, you, you, you're giving up the lie of your false identity. Now, this is a good thing. That's why when we talk about uh, holy relationship, we also are using the word uh, true intimacy. We are not talking about body, sexual intimacy, we're talking about unity of mind, one mind is what we're talking about. That's the intimacy. The intimacy doesn't come about by trying to change the form or generating it through bodies. So Bhavna, you had a prayer there, here we go, this movie is, whoa, Jesus is saying, I'll make it crystal clear for you, Bob. <laughs> you prayed for the answer, and I'm going to really show you what I meant by it, because you're right. You, your prayer was, I want to love everyone. I want to love everything. I want to love without conditions. Yeah, that's the prayer. Your, your prayer is very high. And you said basically, well, but all the movies and the people seem to be very concerned about um, sexuality. What's, what's that have to do with one mind? You know, that's your question. I have a friend in England who, who wrote to me recently, and she said, um, spiritual awakening is like an, a former alcoholic who has released um, alcoholism, who continues, though, to live in a bar. <laughs> An alcoholic who's released alcoholism and lives in a bar. And some of you know what I mean by that statement, because when you look at the world, Jesus is saying, you, you've already escaped, you know, you're with me. <laughs> but you seem to be watching a Distractionville movie. <laughs> But my, my conduit, David, is going to give you my words <laughs> and say, be not disturbed <laughs> by the images that you're watching. <laughs> and remember the workbook lessons. Number one, nothing I see means anything. <laughs> Number two, I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. So what we're starting to realize from this movie is you cannot legislate peace of mind you're not going to be able to generate a society that produces peace, even though there's many attempts. Like in Costa Rica, they actually have a, a, a peace university down I visited in Costa Rica. That's nice. I, that's different from my university, <laughs> peace university. And they've got Gandhi there and all the great peacemakers are, are statues and everything, this and that. But what Jesus is saying, no, no, it's not going to be societal or political. It's your mind. It, your mind is going to heal by learning to listen to the Holy Spirit, and then your perception will heal. And then in the end, your perceptual problem will disappear, because it's not the truth. God created you. Your, the perceptual distortion can't block you from knowing who you are. Nothing can stop you from knowing who you are. You're destined to remember who you really are. So we're, we're getting to the point now where little by little, um, 
Jonas is having experiences with the giver. And you, you could see how playful he was with Fiona, where uh, he was told that, uh, that he, he doesn't have to obey the rules and that he can be rude. So I don't think that that, uh, that thing that they just did was really part of the community rules, but it was pretty much like his sled ride that he experienced. He was taking uh, Fiona on a sled ride there, you know, so he's starting to let it come through him. He's not so concerned about the rules of the society anymore. He's starting to wonder maybe there are secrets uh, that are are been have been blocked. That are there's there's secrets and lies that that need to be brought out to the surface. And even the givers said, you know, sameness is good. And Jesus would say, yeah, sameness is is truth. <laughs> sameness is truth, but but also you won't find it in the form. So don't. Don't go looking for sameness in form because the ego made the form. <laughs> You're not going to expect the ego to take you to sameness. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit can use what the ego made to take you back to the truth, to back to the oneness, to the love. Okay, so you ask, what is holy relationship? What is true intimacy? This is showing us now. When we begin to open up intuitively to the Holy Spirit, he's going to show us a broader range of emotions. He's going to show us a broader use of memory so that we can transcend the fear and transcend the pain. You see how the chief elder is worried, concerned, very much into control <laughs> and very suspicious and fearful of uh, Jonas's training. And, and with the giver, he's starting to feel more expansive. He's starting to build his confidence. He start to, to opening his perception is expanding very rapidly. And he is seeing colors and shapes and memories that, that his whole society has been prohibited from seeing so that the protective mask of the society can be maintained. And that's in one sense, that's what happens when we follow Jesus with the Course he's going to start to expand our perception. He will guide us and take us in ways that will open our mind up. Instead of feeling so limited and boxed in, he will start to show us miraculous experiences that really show us that there's much more than we ever knew in the past, that, the, that our range of perception has been very narrow and limited, but Jesus is going to take the barriers off. He's going to keep expanding our perception. Now, a lot of you know that I I know uh, that I I know that when you've hung in there, like like Wesley and Angie, you know, wow, you came in with such sincerity. You go into the relationship. You you say, I'm in it, I'm in it for the healing, and then you have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> because at first you get more of a broader range of experiences. And, and then when you get a broader range of experiences, then the Holy Spirit's going to allow some real darkness to come up. Not, it's not real in any real sense, but it's, it's believed in. <laughs> it's, it's the unconscious mind will come up. And that is where the forgiveness really comes in, because you really have to have faith to release that darkness. It seems very, very threatening to the relationship. And that's kind of what's happened in this movie, where he's slowly developing this trust and this connection with the giver. And he's very happy to see his mind expanding and to be welcoming some of these memories. 
But in, in Jonas's mind, he thought the pain was when the, the bumblebee landed on his forehead. <laughs> and he goes, was that pain? And the, the giver said, no, <laughs> that's not the pain. Because <laughs> the giver knows that, that you have to let the unconscious mind come up in order to go through the healing. So that little bumblebee on a forehead is not what, what needs to be shown. So the chief elder sees his position as one who can experience the pain and hold it in. You know, she told, she told uh, the giver, you need to tell him he has to keep it in. <laughs> and that's not what the Holy Spirit wants the pain for. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's going to bring it up into awareness so that you can let it go. Not keep it. Not keep it. <laughs> so this is how the Holy Spirit uses relationships for healing. Because when the darkness comes up, the temptation to project on your brother and sister is enormous. Because it's so, it feels so terrible. And this is where people will say things that they say later on, I didn't mean that. And they'll do things and they say, I didn't mean to do that at all. I'm so sorry. And they feel guilty when the darkness comes up because they still are associating with their person. It's just, just guilt coming up for release, that's all. It's not really personal in any way. I see Amanda nodding. You know, Amanda came there, met Micah at La Casa, went and saw the, the, the Young Messiah movie. Poosh, she all the memories came flooding in, Jesus started talking to her night and day, and it kind of rocked her world. And then once the lid is off, though, then the darkness now can come up as well. So you feel the joy stronger than ever, you feel the love stronger than ever, and the channel is open, so the darkness comes up stronger than ever. And this is why the ego invented defense mechanisms. Where, why do you think the ego invented repression? Why do you think the ego invented denial? Why do you think the ego invented substitution? Why did the ego invent projection? To deal with this intense feeling of darkness. So if you start to associate the darkness with the ego, why would you want to listen to it anymore? You know, if the very thing that's producing the darkness and the guilt is the ego, then we need to start to associate pain and pleasure with the ego and joy and peace of mind with the Holy Spirit. You see, once you start to have miraculous experiences that are very joyful and very peaceful, now you're getting discerning. Now you're going to start to really say, I want to be God dependent. Oh yeah, I'm ready to tick off number one. I want to be 100% God dependent, meaning I want to just listen to the Holy Spirit's guidance for me and only the Holy Spirit's guidance for me. I don't want to be tricked by these genius ego defense mechanisms that try to minimize pain without letting it go. The ego will try to minimize fear without letting it go. Minimize suffering without letting it go. That's what defense mechanisms are. They're attempt to minimize it and keep it. And Jesus is like, how about we let it arise and release it? That's the plan uh, that you will take you back to eternity. Let it arise, feel the feelings, and then let them go. And then you get better at it. I mean, it may take years. I know for me, I was a slow learner. So I had, to do this. I had to do this for a lot of years. I used to say, I wish I had a relationship so somebody could at least hold me when my devastation is coming up. And, and Jesus is like, yeah, that's why I gave you your dog Chipper. <laughs> I said, but I want a different kind of relationship. I want a woman. He said, no, 
I don't think you know exactly what you're talking about. I'm going to give you a dog that will lick your tears, <laughs> lick your face when your darkness comes up. <laughs> so once again, strike it up. Jesus knows what's best. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus knows how we have to go through the healing and not get off into too many other distractions because the ego can have a field day with relationships. <laughs> you know, it can, oh, it can reinforce a lot of guilt when the ego uses relationships. It can turn into a, a house of, of horrors. <laughs> if, you, if the ego is, is running the relationship, of course, that's why we've had tragic relationships. And that's why there seems to be a fear of intimacy, because we feel ego says in our mind, you've been burnt before. You've been burnt before. So now I'm telling you to be single and solo the rest of your life. And then you do it, you follow its instructions, and it says, you're lonely, you're isolated, you're going to die alone. <laughs> And isolate. You see how tricky it is? It takes us in that direction and then it tells us we're going to die alone. <laughs> this is a pretty insane thought system, you know. This is how the ego works. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. You, you have to really get tuned into the Spirit here because the ego speaks out of two sides of its mouth, you know. It, it's a death wish. It's not, there's nothing valuable about the ego. There's no, absolutely nothing valuable about a death wish. So this is the point of the movie now where the giver has now used the memories in a very expansive way to, to draw Jonas's attention where Jonas is saying, okay, I want this, bring it on. You give me more memories. I want the whole package. I want the whole package. And basically the giver is saying, oh, we haven't got to that part yet where I bring up the unconscious mind. But that is an essential part of spiritual awakening. We have to be able to allow the memories of, from the unconscious mind to come up too, to release them. We can't just go try to put paint pink on everything. Go to your mom's house, paint it pink, go paint the dog pink, and then paint the, the cat pink. Then you got an upset stomach, go get some Pepto-Bismol pink, drink some pink, no, this is not about painting anything pink. This is about letting it come up and then letting it go through and, and go out. So we're ready for that stage now. Uh, Jonas, <laughs> we're with you. Hang in there. You're, you're showing the way for all of us. Now we're really getting down to some good stuff. Because in this world, this society, they release... The, the, some of the newborns and they release some of the elderly, but, but to the ego, release is death. To the Holy Spirit, release is seeing the illusion for what it is. You see, there's a big difference. The ego is a belief in death and it perpetuates death, but he calls it by different names. It calls its world of make-believe world, it, it calls some things birth and some things death. It calls some things pleasurable, it calls some things painful. But it's hiding because the ego made the world. And the only way to escape its world is to see that release means seeing the unreality of the ego and its forms. That's the release. The release is not an action in form. In this case, uh, the ego, it, it kills babies, and it, in, in that sense, it, it kills elderly people too, to maintain the, the best, the best humans, the most uh, orderly humans, to maintain its illusion of harmony based on rules that it made up. You see how tricky the ego is. It, it makes up the form and then it defines birth and death, pleasure, pain, thinking that you will fall for it and never discover what's underneath. 
it's always trying to protect itself from being exposed and released. And people have said to me, well, you know, you're using examples, but, but, uh, but David, birth and death are clearly different. One is a beginning and one is an end. And I was like, well, yeah, that's, that's part of the trick of the world too, of beginnings and ends. Wait a minute, what, didn't Jesus talk about this in uh, the Bible? I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. Oh, the Spirit transcends birth and death. The Spirit transcends the concepts of the ego. The Spirit is not tricked. The I am presence is eternal, eternal. It's not something of time. It doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an ending. Well, let's take another example. That's that's kind of an extreme example. Let's talk about pleasure and pain. Let's talk about pleasure and pain. If you read the Course, what Jesus tells you in the Course are that pleasure and pain are the same. Now, how is he going to tell us that pleasure and pain are the same? <laughs> he says, it's the reason that they're the same is that they both share the same purpose. What is that? What is the purpose that pleasure and pain share? The purpose of re reinforcing your identity as a body. <laughs> and I will guarantee you, if you seem to experience a migraine headache, you go, my head is killing me. No, it's not your head <laughs> that's killing you, but it feels that way. You see how the feelings are used by the ego. And if you have an orgasm, you may say, oh God, but I tell you, <laughs> I, I am not fooled. It's not fooling David. <laughs> nada, nada, nada. No. Yeah, I think better than oh God would be ooh la la. <laughs> Let's throw that in there. <laughs> and and I'm telling you, this is how deep this goes because, because Jesus wants us to be miracle workers. Why? So we can expand our perception. Why? So we can forgive the world and realize it's not real. <laughs> That's pretty important, you know. And that's why we're, we're called to follow the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not, it's not a journey of sacrifice. You know, the Holy Spirit will not bring you things that you're not ready for yet. Just like this part of the movie, when, um, when the giver was going to show Jonas some of the unconscious memories, he brought up the feelings by first showing poachers killing an elephant. You see, that was the first step of starting to bring the pain up into awareness. And pain just comes up into awareness and hurt. The Holy Spirit allows it up just a little at a time so it can be released. Believe me, you would not want the whole thing <laughs> at once, <laughs> unless you prefer shock treatment. <laughs> no, this is a gentle awakening where aspects of darkness are, are allowed by the Holy Spirit into awareness so that they can be released. That's how it works. It's a it's a step-by-step -step planned curriculum. So nothing is happening by accident. And nothing is more than you can handle. I know, Wesley, you just wrote to me and you were like, I don't know, I think I'm, <laughs> I've reached my tolerance point. I think, I think this is one of the messages, like, I think I'm at, the, I'm at the edge here. But no, we're never given more than we can release. You know, we always have the capability to pray and to go deep and to release. And, and so we saw first the elephant, the poachers and the elephant came in and then when uh, Jonas walked in, when uh, when the giver was in the middle of a war memory, and then 
Um, and then the giver's hand touched uh, Jonas's arm, and then he was he got to he experienced the war scene, and that was like that was pretty dramatic. That was like whoa, that's a that's a scene really projected from the core of the unconscious mind, a, a, a fellow person being shot and dying right right next to you. That's a that's a very direct experience of the death wish. That was like a, a direct experience. And then he he kind of spun out. You see, he really spun out. And then we saw holy relationship. Fiona, she said, I know what well, something's wrong. I know, you know, this is how it works. In relationship, you can pick it up vibrationally when somebody's really going through it. They may say they're fine, but inside they're not fine. He was not fine by any means of it. He was devastated. And Fiona picked it up. And she said, you know, like, tell me, you know, and then that did encourage him to say, you know, stop and taking your stop taking your injections and just use an apple, put a little bit of blood on an apple and and uh, that was pretty much that rocked her world a little bit, you know, like you're breaking the rules, like, what do you mean don't take the injections and I can't, I'm not going to use an apple, that won't even work. Oh, I've been doing it for a month. It, it does work, you know. So it spurred him on to reach out to her in a helpful way to help her undo some of her beliefs. You see how it worked. Because she opened up and said, tell me about it. Then he was able to say something that would help her start to release the false beliefs. That's how the miracle works. We just have to remember to keep joining and keep connecting. And, and we have mighty companions that share the same purpose, that share the purpose of awakening. And that's, that's why they're in our, our dreamscape. That's why they're in the movie. It's because they're there to be reflections of, of healing and of awakening and of exposure in, in, a, in a gentle accepting way. And we need that. We, we need those experiences. Now, Rosemary was, was the one that uh, maybe 10 years ago had, had been told by, uh, by the chief elder, you know, you are to be the, the receiver of memories. And she went into the same training with the giver. And she reached the same point where she was like, I want to know everything. Don't hold anything back from me you know, give me everything. And, and he showed her memories of loss of a baby being taken from the, its mother and, and some that that the same thing happened to uh, her to Rosemary as she flipped out. And this is why the Holy Spirit has to work in gentle steps, you know, you may pray and you may say I want salvation now. And the Holy Spirit has to work with the mind and just bring in bits and pieces at a time to let the darkness up. So it's really a, a planned, systematic way of letting darkness up so that you can let it go. So you can see, see that it doesn't have, it's not who you are. It doesn't, it doesn't need to control you. You, you thought it up and you can unthink it. <laughs> you made it and you can unmake it. <laughs> and you believed in it and now you can unbelieve it which is what release is about. That's what the miracle does. It just shows the false is false. So this movie is absolutely spectacular at showing behind the curtain of the ego. We're, we're, we're all in the Wizard of Oz and we have watched our dog Toto pull the curtain on the wizard and we are seeing what is behind the curtain. We are seeing what that wizard is trying to do. And we're seeing that we don't have to buy into this. And Jonas now, he's going to have to, now he's going to have to be called into action to be a conduit of the Holy Spirit. Because before he just thought everybody was going to elsewhere. You know, they, were, they were like taken away. Now he's seeing that they are being eliminated. And he is saying, can't they see the body's not moving? And the giver saying, he, your father doesn't know what he's doing. 
and none of us know. <laughs> That's why Jesus said on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> if we really knew what was going on, we would just do the Truman Show. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> we, we're, not, we're not playing this game anymore. But, but when we don't see it, when we really are still seeing through the ego's lens, then it seems like it's, it's difficult because we, we believe in it. Our interpretations of scenes and scenarios are that they're really happening. We don't see that they're hallucinations and they're projections uh, coming from our, from our sleeping mind, from the unconscious. We, we actually think they're reality. When we look through the ego's filter, we, we believe that they're real and the Holy Spirit has to show us that they're not. So that's why we can only take a little bit at a time. We can only take it step by step here. We can't, you can't get ahead of yourself in this. So you don't have to worry about trying to jump ahead. <laughs> it's more about staying present with what's, what's coming up. That's, that's, what the, that's what the faith is about, staying present when the darkness starts to rise up. So here we go, we're seeing now He's, he's, he's really starting to see behind the curtain. Okay. <laughs> I think Jonas is beginning to question the family concept. <laughs> I, I talk about this, I've been talking about this for decades and people go, David's crazy, he's, he's, he's off his rocker. No, I'm not, <laughs> I am not. <laughs> this, <laughs> people say, no, no, David, I can handle that. Just let me handle that on my own. I know everything. I said, okay, but <laughs> I think the Holy Spirit is there to help you with this one. Because he just said, he said, where's Gabriel? And he says, his mother said, uncertainty has been taken back to the nursery. Oh, when mom starts to talk like that, <laughs> then you get, you've got to start to wonder. Hmm, <laughs> is that the Holy Spirit <laughs> speaking through it, you know? And then, oh, the father says, well, he failed his test of maturity. And so he's, we have, to, he has to be sent to elsewhere. Well, old Jonas has just seen a few elsewhere scenes. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff it would be good to know. No, you're not abandoning anybody when you release these concepts you're actually coming whole back to your whole mind. You're actually allowing your mind to integrate to wholeness. You actually have to realize that it's not about sticking with definitions and concepts from the past and trying to fulfill roles and, and build an identity and build a, a worth based on past roles. You actually have to start to see that it's a vibrational thing, that your mind is being called to release this world. And you will still be able to be used by the Holy Spirit in many, many situations. You know, to truly love that family is to truly follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit and let the wisdom of the Holy Spirit come through. Maybe you won't be guided to say much. We've We've talked about that, and um, I think, Bhavna, you mentioned that in your prayer. You weren't saying as much to the family. Uh, the, very good. You're getting wise. <laughs> now you start to realize you can't, you can't speak all of this to the family because it's not the family's lesson. <laughs> it's your lesson. It's not their lesson. It's your lesson in, in release, in healing release. This is, this is the beauty of it all. So Jonas, he's just got to the point now where um, um, even when um, his mother started saying, you know, precision of language, um, you could see now even his little sister Lily had a look on her face. Like she's, she's wondering what's going on too. She was not happy to hear that precision of language warning, because uh, she could feel Jonas is speaking from his heart, like now he's activated. And this is what happens when we do get activated to really, really open up 
to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, then we actually are open to being shown, how would you use me, Holy Spirit? What would you have me say? Where would you have me go? Who would you have me meet? You know, these are the things that start to come into your mind when you're activated as a miracle worker. You don't have to kind of straddle the line between the past and the present, because the present moment is the point that you're going to let the Holy Spirit use the symbols of the past to free your mind from the past, to become present. And that's, that's a huge difference. That's what it means to be a miracle worker, is to be tuned into the moment and be open to let anything come through that needs to come through. Because in the end, you aren't teaching people you're letting your mind teach what it would learn. Whenever you let the Holy Spirit speak through you, you're literally speaking what you need to hear, what you need most to hear. And sometimes it takes a little while to practice this, but then you find yourself being used in so many different ways by the Holy Spirit, and you feel this heart-to-heart -heart connections, and you feel this deep love and this deep intimacy, and then in this place of peace and relaxation and stillness, words come through your mouth, and then when you walk away you think, wow, I needed to hear that, because what you said was for you, it wasn't for them, it was for the mind, for, for the mind, the one mind that's waking up, your, that was your gift to the whole universe when you spoke from your heart. It wasn't person to person, it was literally from the heart to the heart. And then you start to feel your heart opening and you go, wow, oh my gosh, I never knew this was possible. That's what, that's what a holy relationship is. You see, uh, even um, last night, um, I think they were talking, uh, Linda was talking, and I think Jessica was talking, where they, they, they said, well, when I first read in the Course um, about the holy relationship, uh, they both said, I want one. <laughs> Isn't that the way that, that it works? I want one of those. Kind of like in the movie The Island, where the Ewan McGregor character, as soon as he gets out from underneath, underground, he gets out to Earth, as soon as he sees a motorcycle go flashing by on the highway, Scarlett Johansson turns to him in the movie, and she says, what was that? And uh, Ewan McGregor says, I don't know, but I want one. <laughs> so, so we have the human beings, they get to the course, and they, they get in there, and they're reading miracles. Oh, boy. It's a big book and a miracle. 50 miracle principles. I don't know. Does he expect me to be a miracle worker? I'm not going to tell my mom or dad that they think I'm nuts. And then, okay, chapter two, Revelation. Whoa, that sounds intense. You go, you go through, you finally get to chapter 15, start reading 15, 16. Holy relationship. I want one of those. <laughs> And then Jesus is like, listen, uh, just stay with me here. <laughs> stay with me. In my case, he knew I needed Chipper, the dog. <laughs> Jesus, he knows what, what we're dealing with here. I, need, I needed about 16 years of Chipper. <laughs> That's what I got. But Whatever we need, we get, you know, I got a dog, with, I got the pink tongue treatment, you know, for 16 years, so that I needed that. I needed to feel loved and accepted, I needed to cry. I couldn't, didn't feel like I could do it in front of my family unit. <laughs> so Jesus had me go in the basement and cry in front of my dog, uh, Chipper, and then lick, 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 and then he's like, that's good, let it up, let it all up, you know, you need to heal, that's good. It was better than psychotherapy because I it, Chipper never charged me a dime. <laughs> Sixteen years of psychotherapy, I'd probably still be in debt. <laughs> but I got the pink tongue treatment. It, it, Jesus always knows the best. So 
here we go. I'd say at this point now, Jonas is activated. He's he's actually ready to be a miracle worker. He he's he's on to it now. He knows there's some kind of spark and joy and love that is what the holy relationship is all about. And all he's going to have to do is, first of all, resign from the family unit <laughs> and actually resign from the world, from the whole construct <laughs> that he seems to exist in. That's all you have to do, nothing much, just resign from the family union, unit and resign from the society, the community. So let's see how he does it. He's like our way shower today, Jonas. Show us the way, Jonas. We're not going to be stopped. <laughs> Some of us have felt that way, this way on our spiritual journey. <laughs> we, we decide to get activated and all of a sudden, oh my God, what the hell is this? It's a chase scene. <laughs> but I always say, if, if you want something from the world, the world will want something from you. <laughs> so. But it starts somewhere, you know, Jonas saw that birthmark on Gabe and he felt this deep connection with little baby Gabe, Gabriel. And in his mind, even when the, even when the givers said, you're not ready. <laughs> and he says, when they decided to kill Gabriel, I was ready. <laughs> That's a that's crossing the line, you know. I can, that's no family unit is not what I thought they were, you know. That that's crossing the line there. So you, it always starts with you starting to realize that there's something in your heart that knows the truth, something in your heart that knows the goodness, something in your heart that feels the joy, feels that deep connection. And that's what you're going to follow. And as I was saying, maybe quite a few times ago on one of my Saturday uh, workshops, I said, you learn to do the next right thing. That's all guidance is. Moment by moment, do the next right thing, <laughs> which is really do the next right minded thing. You know what that is. You know in your in your mind, when you come to a crossroads, there's the next right thing. And that's all you need to have the faith for. That's where you bring in your willingness to do the next right thing. So in this movie, you know, Jonas just had a moment where he realized that, oh, they're going to kill Gabe, they're going to send him to elsewhere, they're going to kill Gabriel, and he just thought, hmm, I need to do the next right thing, which is go get Gabriel. <laughs> you know, he did, he got on his bike and he went right in there, right to Fiona. He didn't mess around. And now that he's got Gabriel and he's on his bike, he's just doing the next right thing. The best part of the rest of this movie now is going to show that when you do the next right thing, everything will be orchestrated for you. Everything that you need to wake up will be given you. And you don't even have to know how. The Holy Spirit is the how. <laughs> the Holy Spirit knows how to provide for you. This is what I mean by being 100% God dependent which is our first, by far, our first uh, theme. When you really feel in your heart and you know you're going to do the next right thing, then everything else will be added unto you. This is like in the Bible, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else shall be added unto you. So Jonas is just following his heart now. He, he saw the lie, but he's, he springs into action based on I am here only to be truly helpful. <laughs> this is, a, I am a here to represent him who sent me. I am here to represent God. And I'm here to represent the goodness. And then everything else will be given to me so I can represent the goodness. It's not a complicated thing. That's how our faith expands. So here we go. He's, he's heading towards 
the the giver's house, but he's got uh, Gabriel in in on his bike, and he's he's being chased. <laughs> Let's see what happens here. It reminds me of E.T. E.T. Phone home. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Strike one up for feeling the feelings. <laughs> you see, if we just give ourselves permission and allowance to feel whatever comes up, that's a huge key right there. That's the undoing of repression. That's the undoing of denial. That's the undoing of hiding. And this movie really gives you an insight, a very powerful insight into the reason we, we have our guidelines of no private thoughts and no people pleasing. Because we've just been in the habit of denying our feelings and in the habit of denying our thoughts. You see? We just had a, it was a bad habit, it was an ego habit. It, I call it pretending, you know, that, that to, to act is to pretend. We've been acting out thoughts and acting out roles. We've been acting out what we should do, what we believe we ought to do. And it's all been based on a past belief called ego. And so you see this movie starts to show us that if we're willing to go through the boundary of memory <laughs> that, that keeps the unconscious sealed and out of reach, then, then we will heal. It, the healing is certain. Like Jonas said at the end, he could hear a song in the, in the house, Silent Night, he could hear the song back from where he came from, and he said, who knows, maybe it's just an echo, but that's, that's all we need right now is that echo. Jesus calls it the song, the song of prayer, that echo that will never go out, that keeps singing us home. It's interesting, even with the story of Siddhartha and opening up his journey to experience being the Buddha, that when Siddhartha was asleep, he was asleep in the palace, in his father's palace, and he had servants, and he had wealth, he had fame. Siddhartha was destined to be the king, but he was asleep in the palace, and then he heard a song. Yes, both Buddha and Jesus heard a song, a very deep song calling them home. And, and even in this movie, the music, when Rosemary's playing at the piano, it's the music, it's the memory through a song calling us back to the, the song of heaven, the song of our true reality. And, it, and once we tune into this song, then that's that's the beginning of the end of the ego. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter how long. Nothing really matters except that we answer the call. So I think Jesus is, wow, what a perfect orchestration. You know, Francis and I were sharing in the first session on Friday about, about coming to the power of the moment, like when Francis was sharing that even though her father was in China, even though she was in Australia, even though they didn't have the all the technology that we have today, and it was many years ago, she could share about the power of the present moment of the now, and her father reflected that back and said, you're right, it's all right here, right now. It wasn't even a matter of physical proximity, it was just tuning in to that moment of release where everything is set, all the captives are set free in this moment. Everything is, is freed from in one moment, if we decide, if we truly decide. So, and then last night with the beautiful sharings with 
Nicholas and Jiska and and Linda, they were all sharing about how they something touched them at some point, something touched them very deeply. And then for Nicholas, it was in those early years uh, after high school and the relationships, and then started things started to dismantle, fall apart. What's it all about? What is this all for? And it led to an opening of there is a way. Uh, as Linda said, there, there must be a better way. There must be a better way. And it is there. That's what Bill and Helen discovered. And now it's been published again for the whole world to, to witness to there is a better way to live. There is a way to release the past. And yeah, this movie always brings tears to my eyes because it's it's so acted out. It's it's not really religious at all. It's not overtly spiritual, but it is it touches the heart of there's something that we're called to, and all we have to do is be open to it and then say yes to it. And as soon as we say yes to it, then we really get a more of a context. Jesus will just fill in the blanks. <laughs> he'll say, he'll take us into heights of happiness. He'll take us soaring into the light, soaring in spirit. And it starts with our willingness to, to say, yes, okay, I, I will go with you in this journey. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know the form. <laughs> I don't know the form. But I do deep down inside know that everything I need to remember who I am will be provided, will be given to me. Because the Holy Spirit is the giver. And I really loved in the end of this movie how when uh, the Jeff Bridges character, the giver, was there talking about love <laughs> right at a at a ceremony of of killing Fiona. He's in there talking about love. And meanwhile, Jonas and Gabe are crossing the threshold of memories at the same time. Minds are joined. <laughs> They, they both were receivers and they were the givers, the givers of that beautiful correction. They both linked up. And then there was, of course, uh, his, his daughter was there too, Rosemary. Rosemary, in his mind, you know, he said, I had a daughter. He was reminding uh, of everyone that love is a power and love is a choice. Uh, and then I think you can really see the contrast because Meryl Streep, she's so good at acting everything. <laughs> she can act out anything. She can act out the ego. She said, people are weak. If you give them a choice, they will always choose wrong. <laughs> That's, she's like giving us the whole ego philosophy. People are weak and if you give them the choice, they will always choose wrong. You see how dark and pessimistic that the ego is. You see that even when, when uh, Jonas goes flying off the cliff like E.T. <laughs> and lands, that eventually she sends somebody to go after him, to find him and to lose him. <laughs> and that's what ego, in the Course, Jesus says, the ego will pursue you beyond the grave. Don't think RIP. Don't think you just have to die in form and, and you can rest in peace. <laughs> oh, oh, the ego will be waiting <laughs> there, <laughs> waiting for that RIP. For the ego, RIP means rip. Let me just rip you back into hell. <laughs> that's, that's called reincarnation, by the way. So how many of you are... <laughs> Are, are willing to not go for the rip cord. <laughs> it, when in the end, when we get that silver cord toward the light, let's let's go be pulled back into the light of of remembrance and awakening. And why should we wait till the body dies? Jesus didn't. 
<laughs> he's our way shower. He, he resurrected his mind three years before he laid the body down. He resurrected three years before he laid the body down. He had three fun-filled years of going around saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. Oh, I remember the scene when the when uh, Mary and Martha, you know, the word came to Jesus. He was just teaching. He was teaching in his parables and everything. And somebody came and said, oh, Jesus, there's bad news. Uh, your close friend, uh, Lazarus, is dead. And basically Jesus said, this one is not to the death. Why? <laughs> it's because guess who's got the key to eternal life? They're trying to deliver bad news to Jesus that his best friend is dead. And he says, this one is not to the death. So then he slowly, not he didn't run, he slowly makes his way to Mary and Martha. He's a turtle for God. He's doing his turtle thing. <laughs> he slowly makes his way. And then when he finally gets to Mary and Martha, they're, they come out and they see him and they start crying. And they're crying and they're crying. And they said, Lord, Lord, if you had just been here a few days ago, you could have resurrected like you did the other ones. You could have resurrected our bro beloved brother. Lazarus, your friend, Jesus is like, stand clear. <laughs> he, goes, he goes over to the grave. <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. Lazarus, come forth. No order of difficulty in miracles. No order of difficulty in miracles. Even a man who was in a sarcophagus, it, it, in a grave for three days with smelly, stinking clothes, death clothes on. And all Jesus had to say was, I am the resurrection. Three words. Whoosh, and out comes Lazarus. And you better believe the people turned white. You better believe they turned white, because that is not your daily act occurrence on planet Earth. <laughs> but that is the resurrection and the life. That is seeing beyond the world of images, beyond the appearances. He was, he was lifted up by God because he remembered who he was, and therefore that is the gift of God, showing that you cannot die. So, what a great movie, what an emotional movie, but what a great movie at, at allowing us to feel our feelings and, and let them up, and realizing that things aren't going wrong when the darkness is arising. Things aren't going wrong. Things are going just as planned when the darkness is coming. You don't have to start to think to yourself, what did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? Or what mistake did I make? It's just the, the darkness is coming up to be released. That's, that's all. And Jesus is with us. I mean, I feel so fortunate. I mean, everybody's talking about all the things that are going wrong with the world. Let's look at what's going right. <laughs> I, think the, I think we can see the positive here is we have got the, the instructions of Jesus. And I, I admit, I did dive into this over the last 36 years, but it's, I, I'm telling you, this, it's really good news. It's absolutely joyful news. The dead arise, the, the sick are healed, the lame can walk. It's, it's a turnaround in the mind from being upside down to coming right side up to the light. And then all is clear. So I hope you enjoyed that movie. I, I could tell with the uh, theme this week, I, oh, they're really, these are some deep themes. We, Jesus, you better really give us 
better better give us a great movie here because that's we need to really experience this uh in our heart and he did as usual he delivers one more time <laughs> so thank you all for for being with me and sharing this great movie and i feel like oh my heart always feels so wide open when i watch uh this movie i feel so happy to be able to share it with you and hope it brought the hope to your to your heart because it really showed you the whole picture the absolute whole picture of spiritual awakening it's a masterpiece so i will turn it back over to pete and i know you've got a day of letting it come up let those emotions come up uh, during the breakout room and during the q a and uh, i will see you tomorrow francis and i will be back we'll we'll open it up so you all can share whatever's on your heart and maybe whatever if, if something arises or questions just uh bring it up tomorrow on the open session we'll we probably will go longer than two hours but that's the way it goes so jesus will will lead us okay god bless